Hello, and welcome to Voice Goes Electronic, OTC trading under MIFID II. Uh, my name is Roddy Kasani. I'm Senior Fixed Income Analyst at uh, TAB Group, and I'll be guiding the discussion today. Uh, I'm joined by Randolph Roth, member of the Executive Board of Eurax, uh, who's also served as CEO of Zimmery uh, and what has had roles as Head of Strategy and Head of Market Structure at Eurax before. So it should be a very interesting and um, a profitable discussion for everyone involved. We aim to make this as interactive as possible, so please do get involved on the Q&As, uh, as you can see where you've logged in. Um, and there will be polling questions as we go along, um, and we'd encourage you to, to get involved with that because actually it will help inform the discussion um, as we go along. So the intention today is to talk about the tangible evidence that we've seen so far in OTC trading as we've seen um, the rise in electronic adoption and how that's affected the way people trade, um, what type of choices they've been making, and also how that's fed down to the workflow, to the available solutions ahead of the implementation of MIFID II next year. Now, that's going to be very important because as we think about what we can expect, um, we think it's very important that people look beyond uh, the basic compliance burdens or the basic rule sets to what we can glean from trading behavior and then also the most efficient and um, uh, effective way to manage that change in the workflows enriched by what we now know about market standards, market behavior, and the way both the buy and sell side have interacted in this, in, in this different um, uh, market structure that's now developed, right? And I think the key thing to bear in mind is that we're actually at stage two now, so we do have rich and tangible data from the U.S., um, we, uh, as, as MIFID ramps up, we're going to have this uh, disparate regulatory reform regimes interacting with each other, and that's going to be the key differentiator there. Um, we've seen a massive change in assets under management, in the proliferation and methods of electronic trading, um, a big change in credit fundamentals, and the dynamics in bid and ask spreads. Uh, liquidity premiums within the wider fixed income world, and then more specifically in the OTC markets, the specific challenges that that's meant for people. Uh, what I've done here is pull up a quote from Michel Barnier just to refocus us all on the original intention of the MIFID rules, uh, which was really focused on the market transparency uh, and the efficiency side of things, as well as the protection for investors. And what that's meant is, uh, uh, is a focus on centralization and automation of the workflow, uh, and that's actually very much in tandem with what we saw in the U.S. Um, and we talked earlier about how, what data, what evidence there is of that in that four-year period we've seen since CEF trading came in on the U.S. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that now in, in, in the specific pockets and silos of the fixed income world, right? So what we mean when we say the OTC markets is are all of these asset classes that you can see listed on the right and you can see over a four-year period the electronic adoption that's happened since, and not, and the important point to make here is that not all of these are mandated, right? So uh, a, a lot of this is voluntary electro, uh, electronification. A lot of this is the workflow adapting and being pulled in um, to, uh, to to what pre-exists as, as people have onboarded, uh, as the technology has been upgraded, and as the optionality has been uh, rolled out to to the trading floors. And the most important part of that is the non-match swaps at the, top, to, at the top over there. We'll talk a little bit more about that as we drill down on the numbers and what we expect to see in the future. Um, but when, when you have a look at the overall trend there across all of the thick asset classes, not just uh, the fixed income side, you'll see that the overall trend emerges, right? So you, you've got a centralization of the market structure through automation. Uh, you have transparency requirements that have pulled other asset classes into it, um, and you, you, you've had um, uh, alternative market makers emerge to fill the vacuum um, as, as dealers in some areas have been disintermediated or disintermediated themselves as they focus much more on the efficiency side. Um, and that's very important from the, from, from the data perspective because when you start to think about how data feeds those cycles, um, how, th how the availability of data develops uh, and starts to become a virtuous circle with, with all of this new functionality that's existed, you see a, a, a change in the way people trade. And the best way to show that is on the next slide, right? So 
um, we've taken the present point in time, updated to today, uh, for all of those asset classes, and you'll see in the boxes the, the trading protocol that is prevalent within those asset classes, right? That's not to mean every trade within that um, uh, is traded either on voice, electronic RFQ in the middle, or on a fully order-driven order market, but that's the direction of travel. That's where you'll see the majority of trades. Those bubbles represent the size of, size of the market, and you'll see the slight anom anomaly here is that in the off-the-run, which is, which is relatively large, it's remained uh, what, we, what we would categorize as in the voice brackets. And the main reason for that is, is you know, very specific dynamics within that market, within the way people, people like to trade there, and actually the, the, a lack of an impetus for change, right? But when you, if you look at the red dotted line in the middle, you'll see actually it becomes quite binary in the fixed income world, right? So what a lot of people tend to think about is more of a, an equities model at the end, so moving on to order book, but there's, there's various reasons within the fixed in income markets and everything below that dotted line falls into this where you have non-standardization, a lack of fungibility and actually um, a roadblock related to the way people like to trade. The prevalence of certain trading protocols and certain trading behaviors that have, that have kind of stopped the development fully onto the order book. And then also the liquidity dynamics um, and the proliferation and fragmentation of securities overall. So what I've done is tried to summarize that on the left in terms of two different models, right? And so, you, you know, you, you have a, a fully electronic model as a tangible endpoint there uh, where liquidity is, is, is widely available, where you have standardization, where you have a big depth of market um, and a reduced need for intermediation. That's both voluntary on the sell side or um, almost enforced because of the imposition of centralized trading venues uh, crossing networks, etc. Uh, and then the second is what I call the hybrid model, but it's basically voice and bilateral RFQ today, and, we, and there's big reasons why that might change, um, and uh, the need for a certain amount of selectivity to manage your liquidity needs, to, put, to manage the price formation process, uh, and the way that price information is treated in the context of the new rules. Um, and at this point, Randolph, you know, I'd like to hear if you have any thoughts on how that market structure is, is sketched out and, uh, you know, whether you, you can see any, any uh, evolution from your side on this. Yeah, thank you. Um, I mean, to me, this model is a very good model um, to, to explain, A, um, the degree of maturity and standardization products have, B, where they stand in their product life cycle, and see also where the different marketplaces are located. So exchanges have traditionally obviously the spot on the right uh, upper side, uh, and the traditional IDBs who organize the phone market are on the bottom left side. And what we have seen in the uh, recent years is obviously that the IDBs have pushed many of their products uh, uh, to more electronic means. Uh, uh, they also have moved their own business to more electronic means. I mean, the uh, I means the best example being a ICAP, which even split up into two entities, an electronic uh, brokerage and a an, uh, voice brokerage. Um, so that that those things are, are very well explained. Um, however, there's also sort of a second um, layer of complexity on top of that model, which also results, or is explained from the model, which, but ultimately results from the observation that no matter how standardized and liquid uh, a product are, there's always order sizes or order complexities which are um, not addressed by the order-driven model, by the standard order book. So even if we go to the upper right-hand side, uh, take here the treasury futures or the Europe uh, in Europe the the Bund futures or Eurostox futures. Uh, there are as liquid as it gets, but still there is a certain portion which is not addressed by the order-driven markets. And um, in futures, that portion is very slim. In if you go to uh, options, that portion increases significantly, especially in in, in Europe where we had. 
traditionally options have been uh, organized by the call around market rather than the floor uh, when they migrated away from the floor and uh, so we have easily 50% of the most liquid options in, in, in Europe um, traded uh, on the call around market so over voice and this is where now it gets interesting with the background of, of MIFID um, from an exchange point of view, obviously we like if products move up the circle into the order driven space, but at the same time uh, we also need to recognize and recognize there are uh, order sizes and complexities which are not never going to be covered by the one size fits all sort of order book and uh, and so as an exchange uh, we are looking also for the RFQ space which will um, grow in importance in our view through the MIFID requirements especially on transparency and best execution which will be a catalyst for more things moving electronic. Okay, that's very very interesting Randolph and I, I, from your perspective you were talking about sort of RFQ on the exchange but, but when, you, when you look at the, the wider market that's the roadblocks for that that the for that change in the direction of travel. Um, do you think that will change that that changes over time, or do you think that, that that's pretty what we're seeing here on this slide in the snapshot um, is a is a pretty stable um, representation of where I guess the OTC the OTC and the uh, ETD interactions will be um, in in the next five or six years or so. It will be stable in the sense that all these means will exist. So we have all our driven market, obviously, we have uh, electronic RFQs. We also have a space for voice. We have in between chat driven markets. So all of these elements will be there, but uh, we will, we think that there's going to be a shift uh, between the elements. And the biggest shift is probably going from voice to uh, RFQ models rather than from RFQ models into the order driven markets. Um, so that, that is where we expect the biggest shift in the way things are done. So there's always been products traded partially or mainly voice, but uh, it will more and more uh, sort of the more on the run things are, obviously, the more easier it will be. Uh, but what is considered on the run. I think uh, the, the sort of the, the separation line, the, the red line you have here, will sort of sw uh, move, and there will be more things move above the red line. Okay, great. That's a very interesting point. That's a very good segue um, to the next point that we have to make, and I don't think anyone on this call um, needs a reminder of what the overall method rules are or uh, an ABC of, uh, of what changes um, are being made as, as we roll MIFID, MIFID II out across a, a very wide um, range and suite of products um, in, in an almost unprecedented way. But the really important part of that for that bucket that remains stable and below that red line um, is really the, the, the best execution side of things, the data, the data collection side of things, uh, and how you can do that in markets that will remain that way. So, you know, whether you need additional synthetic price feeds, whether you need internally to develop a definition for comparable products for, for bespoke swaps so that you can have that enriched data um, at the pre, at, and post-trade level and mark to your trades. Um, what the changing liquidity determinations over time mean for you in your trades and your, and your trading decisions, um, how you manage time stamping, syncing of trade data um, across exchanges, and then also you know, between the exchange and non-exchange environment. Um, you still got that kind of one second to manage to. Um, and then the, 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 the overarching requirement for the sell side to publish accurate quotes um, and the need for accurate data and efficient storage and management of data in that workflow. And I think, you know, as we've uh, gone further down the implementation side and almost in contrast to what we saw in the U.S., you're starting to see things like, uh, you know, uh, nominal fines being levied for not being able to provide data. That's all across the sell side, and then also uh, for some of the venues and the data collection companies, etc. That show just how challenging that has been. How that circle 
um, where you go from, you know, accurate data sources, uh, managing your metrics, calibrating, uh, deciding whether to build or buy um, those solutions, what type of uh, – how you incorporate with your overall best execution policy, um, and then, um, you, you know, standardizing and simplifying that process for yourself overall. So we just wanted to kind of drill down and pull that out because it's very important within MIFID that you think of that bucket that has remained stable or could be expected to remain stable outside what you could call the pure order book side of things within fixed income. It becomes a much more natural place to think of how that can be traded alternatively, how you can manage um, and make much more efficient that process overall. Um, so if we think about that as, as almost as like a checklist, um, you need to start thinking about, you know, operational requirements, but how that fits into how you manage uh, the, uh, you know, the performance on a business level of trading desks within firms, et cetera, um, you know, whether you have appropriate uh, order record keeping in, in a discoverable and reasonable way, uh, time frame, if below LIS, you know, how, you, how th those trades are published to the wider market, which was always a, a very big flashpoint for everyone as we were reading the initial rules. Um, and, and very importantly, that applies to the trades that are treated on the RFQ, within the RFQ process. Um, the ability to publicly report that through your APAs um, within 15 minutes, but of course that 15 minutes slides down as we get further and further along the implementation side. Um, <clears throat> transaction reports, <clears throat> excuse me, on a T plus one basis, and your venue choice becomes quite important because you have um, the trading obligation um, a, a, as it applies. Um, that, that runs very much in tandem with the clearing obligation. You need to have a clear idea of the economics of those trades um, and the reasoning within that, um, and your definition of uh, sufficient steps, the multi-factor test, test for best execution that I think we're all familiar with, but as the Q&As have been published, we need to get much harder on the definitions and the development of the market standard there. I think the way that interacts with your um, technology and workflow becomes very, very important. Um, and then um, the, you, you, the, the rankings and the ability to attach that information at a pre-trade level. So these are all the things you, 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 you need to start thinking about, you know, how you, um, you can apply that internally. I think that's going to feed through, um, through the workflow to how people think about, uh, you know, going beyond that compliance level, how people think about trading those pockets that are actually outside the obligations, and that's going to be very interesting. Uh, and, we, and we do have historically um, some evidence that from the U.S. that you know people are very, actually very quick to do that. So when you look beyond the volumes um, to what people are trading where, particularly through the enriched trade report data, um, you can actually see that that process becomes much much quicker um, than, than the actual full scale adoption, maybe through the implementation periods. Right. So so having laid that out. Um, We'd like to open it up and ask you a polling question, which I pulled up and you should be able to see. So what, in your view, will be the main drivers for electronic adoption in the future? And that's that, uh, you know, three, four-year implementation period, I guess, uh, once MIFID II comes through next year. So we've given you, um, you the options there. Um, please do uh, pop something into the Q&A if you have something richer or in the other bracket, but it's competing regulatory regimes across regional markets, and that's things like, you know, CEFs being registered both in the U.S. and Europe, but then also MTFs, how those interact, et cetera, um, and really, the, you know, kind of the best way to, 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 to do that from a, uh, a venue choice perspective. Uh, the need for better data and market intelligence, and that's, you should think about that, you know, more from the business side. Uh, granular data for internal and regulatory compliance, and that's, in the context of your compliance, really. That's a red star on the compliance side. So that's transparency and best execution requirements, as we've just, discuss as we we've just discussed. And then cost efficiency and operational automation. And that's, again, purely from, from a firm management perspective. Um, and then improved market structure and liquidity. That's the general market and any other. So if you could please feed through to the voting on that. That'd be great. Uh, I see something on the Q and A's.
Ah, so so we've just had uh, Josh Hirschman from TrueMid say, I believe all five are main drivers for electronic adoption. So if you could maybe internally rank it in your mind to the number one, that would be great just so that we could have um, – so we can have a rich data source for that because um, I, I, I think it will help drive the discussion. We put those, those all in there um, because we do believe that they are, you know, to some extent drivers. But the main one for you guys is going to be the most important one because it will. I, I think it will help us think about the market structure from that perspective. And I think a lot of people are in, in the questions or uh, inputting their answers, I think. If you could um, let us sum it, that would be great. Good. Right, so we'll move on and come back to the results of that in a minute. Um, right, so now what we'd like to do is drill down and focus on the RFQ protocol particularly, right? So what we've done is we've talked about OTC, we've talked about the way MIFID interacts with that, the pockets we would like to focus on for the purposes of this discussion, um, and how they sit within the kind of wider fixed income universe. And I think what's important when we talk about electronic adoption is to think about the definition of that and how it plays in with um, what what had existed before, right? So on the right-hand side within that pie chart, you'll see the different types of venues and the percentage of, a, the, um, of platforms with API connectivity and how that filters through to what we see as the kind of bank compliance IT spend. So that's an average bank wallet split up by asset class, exchange traded derivatives, the, fi the wider fixed side, but the majority of that cost comes from the OTC, and then equities. And really... As, uh, as we see MIFID uh, coming in further, um, and as we update these figures over the coming year to 18 months, we, we will expect the, the, the kind of fixed side being the main differentiator within the MIFID rules, as in the difference from MIFID 1, to grow very significantly from there, and efficiency on that being, being much more of an imperative. You'll see Europe and the U.S. Um, blocked out as well from, from those global bank IT spends, right? Um, and with that dynamic playing through, I think the the important thing is to think about the end user clients as well, right? So this is some data that we have uh, asking the buy side pretty much exactly the polling question that we we just asked all of you, um, which you know overall what are the challenges for you as you know electronic derivatives users uh, and its cost. Um, the back, the back capital rules for them in terms of the coverage that they receive, um, liquidity and compliance. Um, and then going down, you'll see the things that, that, that you would most likely see. But the key thing is the direction of travel, once again, and 80% see a significant increase in cost of compliance. And this is just purely for, for the derivative side of things post-regulatory overhaul. So that's, good. that's going to be... Um, that's going to be very important uh, as time goes on because when the buy side is dealing with the same kind of pressures that the sell side is looking to looking through um, you one of the one of the key things when that cost um, uh, picture changes is that you won't be able to uh, filter down and pass that cost on to clients or at least that conversation is going to be much more difficult so you need to look for efficiencies in different ways uh, and just a quick word on the cash markets here, what we've seen on the bond trading side, many of you will know this. Maybe five years ago, if we pulled up this matrix, uh, you would have seen on the right-hand side there those RFQ options uh, and many of the other things just not being available. Now we've seen the development of, you know, request for, request for stream, open trading, click to trade, those limit order books kind of come out. Um, you know, pure agency models, independent venues, uh, and also dark pools. So um, as you've seen the pro proliferation of these bubbles, and as you think about that S-curve that we talked about earlier, you would be forgiven for, for, for thinking, right, so we've had this regulatory imperative. We've had um, this change in costs um, picture developing, and we've had the availability of a lot of options within that traditional OTC world. Uh, or, or at least the kind of it, the platform world. So all of that is going to um, combine to fragment and change the way that people are trading. But when we look at the protocols people use, 
uh, within all of those different platform segments that we described earlier. Um, we, we see that actually, in particular, for the end user clients that we were just discussing, RFQ is still very, very predominant, right? Both in the derivatives and the cash side, either electronic or, 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 or on the voice. Um, and, you know, while those alternative options have grown, uh, really for the OTC workflow, RFQ uh, remains dominant within, within that client sphere. Now, as, as Randolph mentioned earlier, within the dealer-to-dealer the -dealer segments, which again have their own challenges and consolidation, um, and are, you know, in, in terms of the, the way people are trading and the, the, the breakout of the volumes, things have developed in that world. It's still, you know, you, you know, very much club-based, uh, and that's the same on the cash side when you look at the treasury world, right? So while you, so having having said that, look, you have this kind of sticky dynamic. Uh, within those those OTC markets, both both on the swaps and the cash side, um, and the, uh, and that that is the way that um, the markets uh, the, the the market the the market standards have reacted. Um, we need to think a little bit more about the RFQ side of things and how that works in New World. What challenges there are there, and how we can retain the functionality. Um, and the usefulness for the end client uh, while still uh, you, you're reacting to the market structure changes. And a good way to see that at a glance is just to think about the, how your price information is treated, right? So um, what we've done is show just basically under method two how your price data, on, uh, your RFQ price data um, <clears throat> would will have to be treated, right? So if you don't, you aren't subject to any of the waivers at the bottom there, um, your LIS, your SSTI, or your, your transparency, um, then you will have to uh, make your quote available, you know, in public as close to real time as possible, and that's a huge challenge to the way we've done things traditionally. And then at the post trade level, um, you know, especially if you're trading, uh, if you if you're going through the venues. Um, your data will, you know, will then have to be reported into your NTA and ESMA, and the important thing is that that will have then be made public, which again will feed that, um, that virtuous circle we were talking about um, in, in terms of data under the new MIFID rules and how we do that. In order to sharpen your thinking on that, we've just um, sketched out, if you think back to that, uh, that cash slide and then also um, the S curve, the platform RFQ models that have been prevalent to date, and you need to think about that in terms of the workflow within the new MIFID, um, uh, MIFID requirements. You've got bilateral on the top left there, um, which is very much broker, uh, dealt with through your broker-dealer. Uh, what we've called the platform RFQ model largely through those multi-dealer platforms or through an independent one where you can you, you know, you have an element of selectivity. You have the choice between your voice and your electronic. And again, think back to that pie chart and how people have decided to carry on. And then the more new one uh, at, at the bottom there, that uh, that all to all, but it encompasses an awful lot of different types within that all to all world, right? So um, you, you can have, you know, full list trading, availability to all members, um, uh, you know, and then an element of negotiation within that. But really, within all of those models, you need to think about um, under MIFID, what, what the changes under the transparency requirements mean for that, what the liquidity and size thresholds within your venue, who the reporting um, obligation lies with, um, your assessment of the counterparty, uh, differences and changes within liquidity and the waiver and deferral regimes, um, and then your, you know, your, your, your compliance burdens both pre and post trade, right? So if you think about those one, two, three models, um, that that basically make up that uh, vast majority of the trading that we saw in those pie charts earlier. Um, that's basically where we are right now. Are there ways we can recondition that going forward uh, to react to the challenges there as MIFID gets um, gets uh, gets implemented going forward? Right. So when we think about uh, those factors from from a kind of um, markets perspective, think back to that non-MAT um, number we saw in the electronic adoption. Uh, we've done a double click there so, so, so you can get a better idea of that voluntary uh, section of the U.S. markets that have now been reported uh, within, that, within the, 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 that, that sort of three-year period since we saw 
um, you know, what we would define as you know full CEF adoption. Um, again, on the pie charts, that's not a, a an apples for apples comparison. That's open interest versus notional. So we've we've expressed it as a percentage, so you can get an idea of market shares. But that's exchange traded versus OTC taking that voluntary, you know, non-match swap electronic adoption number and applying it to what we see on the global side, basically feeding through the U.S. and the European trends and trying to think about the market and the addressable uh, section of of the uh, traditional OTC universe. Um, this is just particular to the derivatives interest rate side of things. Um, what is the uh, addressable market, I guess, for a, a, you know, a significant change in the workflow, maybe reconditioning uh, how people use the RFQ in line with the rules, but also making it very efficient. Um, but, uh, you, you know, I think this is a great way of, of you know, people thinking of, of the size of the market, because if you, even if you think about it from pure market share, you're talking about a nine percentage point change um, by 2020 once we have both regimes, um, you know, fully up and operational. And we think that's probably, you know, on the conservative end, but, you, could, you, you know, there's a lot of moving parts because there's a natural growth, we think, in, the, in driving the exchange traded side of things. Um, and, and the venue traded side of things purely as a result of the rules, let alone the, the, the kind of market behavior change. So, so that's a key point there. And once you think about that, um, you think about the change in the way people are trading, you think about the adoption uh, of RFQ overall, we think it's actually a, a very um, useful way to start thinking about, in particular, the exchange side and how that uh, that, that can be redeveloped. And I think Randolph mentioned earlier, um, you know, there's a lot of players on the exchange side who are starting to think about how they adapt the existing platform functionality that's available to them to try and address an attack um, that the remaining you voice an RFQ style um, uh, pockets that we that we defined earlier. And how those can then be ported into, uh, you know, the, the functionality that's already available on the exchanges, and how that might look like in the context of the RFQ models we talked about, is is this? So, you, so if you think about uh, where we were earlier on the S curve, um, you see you have another green uh, orange dotted line there, uh, and at the top you have basically what we would describe as, as a kind of open RFQ model, and then a selective RFQ model, both of which could be um, used on, on, on exchanges uh, as, currently in, uh, as currently constituted um, with, with very minimal lift from the end user and in a way that makes sense for them with what, they, with what and how they already trade, right? So, you know, where, where you have uh, abundant liquidity, you're looking to trade in, in kind of smaller sizes. You don't really have a need for what under the MIFID rules are described as discretionary trading. Um, uh, and, and you don't really have that much concern in terms of discretion or data. Um, then you would probably use a kind of open RFQ model, you know, quite, quite probably anonymous, uh, really not that, that, that dissimilar um, to what we've seen on, on the platform side. Or at the bottom there, you know, that circle is, uh, represents, you know, some, a selective RFQ model uh, going through your execution broker. Um, and that's where you can really control who sees your prices. You have an element of uh, negotiation. You probably have issues with liquidity or standardization. Or you have specific needs in terms of the, um, uh, the types of trades or strategies you want to use. Uh, or, you know, a kind of relative value toggle that you want to be able to use um, in terms of your wider trading needs. Um, and, and, and that will require you to have an awful lot more functionality. Um, Randolph, I don't know if you've had any points to add to the, the, the two yeah. models, how they might um, interact with the exchange platforms right now and the pockets that, that they might address going forward. Uh, thank you, Adi. Um, this is exactly how we sort of right now look at the RFQ world with those two main models. I guess, I mean, there's various playgrounds, but it makes sense to structure it this way. 
Uh, I mean, the, the, the traditional exchange offering, including Eurex, obviously, is been the open RFQ model. So if people hear Eurex and RFQ, then they think of the there has been an RFQ market making and so, stuff like that. So RFQs being placed in the open order book, displayed to everybody. The use case is that the customer doesn't see a price, for example, in a certain strike, or he doesn't like the price, and then without showing his hands or without showing where he wants to trade to and what size he has in mind, he can request from the liquidity providers uh, a price or a better price. And as long as the people have the feeling uh, there's real customer interest and it's the size is reasonable to be filled in the order-driven market, then the model works. Um, it has lost some of imp its importance uh, because now these days most of the products are constantly have streaming prices. So uh, and then sort of to, to send an RFQ on top is often not necessary because people know where the where, where the price level is and if they feel it's a bit wide and they may place an order inside and uh, it's used but it's not um, hasn't the same importance anymore. However, nonetheless, uh, we will continue to offer it, and it, as a matter of fact, it, with Mifid, it will be even easier to be uh, accessible because it's now also been accessible through order routing system and DMA. But I guess the, uh, the, the more interesting field for this uh, today's topic is the, the lower part, uh, because the, the open RFQ model addresses none of the uh, electronification towards uh, sort of uh, an RF electronification of OTC business and selective RFQ model is the right model there. And um, and that is also the reason why Eurex is in a couple of weeks um, rolling out a new service called uh, Eurex and Light, which um, is a selective RFQ platform. Uh, the goal is starting with fixed income options uh, in Eurex products, the, the, the goal is to provide a platform to arrange, uh, find counterparts to arrange trades which are currently not arranged by Eurex because they're happening outside arranged by the, by the IDBs or by the brokers. And uh, so it is larger or more complex orders and can be filled in the order-driven market. The platform itself is built to replicate the current voice-driven process, but with the advantage of a being having electronified the process uh, of the manual process, which means it's swifter, less error-prone than the full STP into um, the downstream systems, which means in our case entry into the. Um, trade entry service of Eurex and then into the clearinghouse to the extent people want to have it cleared. Um, and finally, uh, the, the third final major advantage is that the full electronic records um, uh, are very useful and uh, major facilitator for best execution purpose. So people, participants will have the full electronic record which they can use any way they want to prove that they have done uh, best execution. Uh, it maintains the advantages of the co current uh, voice-driven RFQ process. I mean, the voice-driven process has a significant advantage because it is a relationship business. If you want to fill a very large order, you can't just signal that to the entire market because the entire market is immediately moving away. So you only want to, to signal it to um, a few counterparts where you trust and where you have sort of an ongoing relationship, so which keeps everybody in uh, sort of in track. So people know if I uh, if I get a call to fill a large order, and if I don't do a good job, then I may not get the next call again. These kind of things are not possible in order-driven anonymous markets. So these kind of things uh, will obviously prevail. As I said, we we, we electronically build the current process. So we have the relationship business in there. The process is multi-step sort of negotiation style. It's driven by the, 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 the requester for liquidity, so by the broker in general. Uh, so he decides whom he requests prices on. He decides whether it's firm or indicative. He obviously sees who responds 
how uh, or who doesn't respond, he decides further down in the process if he has more information from his clients when and how and to whom to uh, uh, sort of provide more information, uh, for example, information on price and quantity, and we um, we just as a platform we monitor that the fair process where um, uh, once information has been displayed that this is also the transaction takes place and it's not uh, uh, taken advantage of, of market makers. All of this is built into the um, standard Eurex infrastructure so any participant, any member of Eurex can right away use it. Um, it's going to be rolled out with a new release uh, and then um, and we obviously in discussions uh, with the participants right now to get this going. Uh, as we said, more products will follow, but for now we focus on fixed income options and um, try to help the market to become more efficient in that space. Okay, that's that's very interesting, and that's it, it, it's interesting you you um, brought up a lot of those points. I think at this point I'm going to um, refer back to the the, the pull results from the question. Um, and, and I, you know, I think it's going to be uh, very heartening for you to hear that uh, the key, the standout, standout winner um, uh, from those factors was the uh, cost efficiency and operational automation side of things uh, at 41% uh, of people's responses. Um, I think you know uh, that actually chimes very much with what we've been saying. The second factor was need for better data and market intelligence, which was 24%. Um, then uh, granular data for internal and regulatory compliance uh, came in at 18%. So if you put those three things together, uh, which are really talking to the issues that we were discussing, um, then I think it creates a, you know a much wider picture. Interestingly, I think you know, the market structure side of things. Um, and the competing regulatory regimes, uh, you, you, you know, came in at 11 and 6 percent. But I think maybe that's because they're kind of second order effects of what we're seeing right now. And people are more concerned about, you know, w what they're going to be doing tomorrow. So I guess, uh, you know, as, as you see these these two different models, Randolph, um, you know, develop on the exchanges. We've, we've, we've talked about the opportunity there um, and kind of sized it. Uh, but you know, do you see, as you look forward over time, any second-order effects developing, any need to kind of tweak this functionality, or do you just see it being rolled out, um, you know, across the product types, maybe beyond fixed income, um, you know, into, in, in a re into the relative value um, sphere, you know, across the asset classes? How do you see that the sort of evolution uh, developing now that you now that you've had the experience of trying to develop and build, well, I guess, one corner of the solution there? Uh, a couple of comments uh, on this. Uh, I mean, a we um, we obviously have ideas how we to develop the current model further, and uh, a lot of them uh, go right in the direction of the feedback. So we have a lot of ideas around a need for better data on market intelligence. I didn't mention that yet, um, but. Um, as I said, an important part of this business uh, for large or complex orders is the relationship business. Um, and uh, we will replicate that because the, um, the, uh, the requ um, requester obviously knows whom he gets things from, but also the, respond uh, the responder knows whom he would, uh, he would get uh, data. But we, if we now have an electronic trail record of uh, what's then going on on the platform, we can all obviously um, provide a lot of analytics, um, obviously on an anonymous, uh, anonymous basis. So a lot of things will be, okay, uh, market um, on either market makers, for example, or also on the on the broker side, will uh, submit data. And we will match their data with uh, all other market makers who agreed to submit data to the pool, and then they can stand how they perform, how 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 how, how good they are, uh, not on an individual ba deal basis, but on average, are they uh, a tick worse? Um, are they smaller in size? Um, or also on uh, percentages which are useful for the brokers, how often? 
uh, is a market maker at the end uh, then good or uh, for the trade if you talk about for example the market maker not always need to uh, provide firm uh, quotes um, how how is the performing at size and things so we have a lot of things um, uh, sort of in the pipe on this looking at the the existing products uh, but also in mind having new products when it comes to new products the goal we have done I mean the fixed income options is not the biggest segment on Eurex it's uh, but we still uh, started there because we wanted to start with uh, one spe solving one specific problem for one specific user group and in this field sort of the dealer to market maker um, space there's no any electronic solutions right now like we, we propose so it makes sense to start there try to help this group if we go into equity index products or equity products some of the uh, just the nuances how things are done are slightly different so we may also rebuild some of the steps we're doing it is part of the philosophy that we we need to go where the, where the voice brokerage market is now and build that electronically and then see over time maybe certain steps will then look different because if you do it electronically you simply do it slightly different but for now we're trying to just to replicate how things are and um, and therefore there may be uh, certain changes requested for other asset classes okay great and um, just a reminder to everyone this is this is uh, at this point uh, kind of an open forum style so if you have any questions or points or um, any additions, please, please do put them through. Um, but I've, uh, you know, I've, I've put I've put up the advantages and disadvantages that uh, Randolph just spoke through. Up. I think from what you're saying, Randolph, it's interesting that a, a lot of that sort of second level functionality you're talking about speaks directly to those best X requirements um, overall and really will help um, the dealers with that. Um, I think the preservation of the relationship side. Um, is very important and a differentiator from what we've seen on the, uh, I guess you could call it the XOTC um, universe so far. So, so, so as, I, as I was saying, the the, the, sel the selectivity um, available in the the kind of voluntary uh, mode of trading has actually been seen in, in, in other markets. We've seen it on, you know, independent the independent stuff that are non-incumbent. Um, that you know uh, did not have a pre-existing market share before implementation under the U.S. rules, um, and we've seen people you know pushing through those non-MAT trades that we were talking about, so non-core currencies, non-standard, not subject to the equivalent of a trading obligation, purely for that processing and data side of things. So it's very interesting. You should say that it'll be it, it'll be very interesting to see in Europe um, how that interaction develops, um, and you know. How significant the, um, the the exchange interfaces, that incumbent role you play within the market structure and within those those wider um, asset classes does develop. So that'll be something to watch out for. Yeah. All right. Absolutely. Great. I, the best execution topic is obviously for large and complex order. It, it is complex. It's not simply okay. This has been the best bid offer in the market for a 50 lot, and there it should trade. Um, so and that's. Um, why it's uh, uh, important to have sort of a degree of freedom for people to provide that where they can pick the prices but at the same time have also the documentation uh, even if somebody looks at it three years later and says so why did you pick the price then there uh, given sort of uh, what was your reasoning and then you can easily sort of distract um, and get that out of the data yeah, yeah. I mean, that's that's a crucial part of it, but I think it's important to say that also, you know, within fixed income, those definitions are going to be, um, you know, a key a key part of it because the the ready availability of data, the need to kind of you know think laterally when you're creating those market standards and how and where you 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 you, you plug it in, to what extent you use third parties, um, is going to be a very interesting part of it from my perspective, in terms of how we map map out the solution providers. Yeah, you know, use of third parties, how the ISVs play, um, you know, with your with your standard interface. To what degree the, um, you know, technology and the interfaces become centralised, 
is going to be very important. So that's, you know, that's again a, a good segue to, to our outlook for 2018 and beyond. Um, you know, basically the key factors that we think um, in terms of the new fixed income market structure in the context of these solutions and that evolution we're talking about. Um, you know, what, 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 what the key things we see um, developing are going to be so that centralization of the trading venues um, and then becoming the key cornerstones uh, within the, this capital markets um, ecosystem um, uh, as, as a way to manage those infrastructure and compliance costs that were the key um, drivers to electronification, according to the poll here, but also according to a lot of our outreach and, uh, um, and our research. And that's been a consistent trend over the last 12 months. So people expect that to happen, and we can't see a way why that doesn't happen with the new rules, right? Um, this implementation period coming up, uh, will trigger another, you know, fundamental change, and this is fundamental change mark two, um, because we've already seen what happened in the U.S. But because of the uh, the cross asset class pressure on the buy side, we think it could be, you know, much more concentrated this time around. We'll see a similar um, similar effect, but it could be actually uh, slightly in, in, more rapid um, than the kind of test trade onboarding process that actually took quite a long time in the U.S. before we started to see. Um, you know, the data and the pure effect trickle through. And that was about a six to 12 month time horizon over there um, before you could see like tangible changes in the trading behavior in the workflow once people were comfortable. Um, but again, the, 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 the implementation date um, was arrived at much quicker um, at that point. Um, then we see uh, the sell side and the interdealer models, um, you know, continuing to develop and change. Uh, but that's, you know, that's going to be much more uh, marked, I think, and, you know, much more tangible. So rather than um, a unilateral business model-led change, uh, you know, what we're going to see is yeah, partnerships, utilities, collaborative models, uh, you know, much more over, much more uh, visible from the outside because you'll see people kind of working together, um, you know, interacting uh, you with different liquidity pools, and again, you know, um, integrating those workflows, you know, within um, exchanges and 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 through venues overall. So that's going to be very 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 important. Um, uh, and again, you know, that, that that hybrid model, the way pricing data and analytics interact, um, is going to be a crucial component of that wheel and how we get to that endpoint overall. Great. So I'm just going to make a last ditch appeal for any questions at this point um, before I ask, uh, you know, Rald, Randolph uh, for any key outlook points and then we can conclude. So Randolph, any key outlook points beyond, um, you know, those, uh, those I've just discussed or do you, is there any variance from your perspective in terms of how you see that evolution developing? Um, no, I, I, I would totally agree. I mean, that's... Um uh, I mean, we. I guess I'm sitting in in your in your um, in in the S curve chart. I'm sitting right now in the in the upper north corner there, <laughs> and looking sort of uh, from where do we move as an exchange? And obviously, we will not move everywhere. But there's lots of players, as you have uh, shown on the corporate uh, bond example, uh, which uh, we could. Place all over the place, also on the on the on the S curve. Um, we just sort of look at the adjacent spaces, and um, from our point of view, uh, I mean Mifid. If you look at the goals of Mifid, um, of course Mifid brings a lot of cumbersome things for all of us, which we need to implement, and some of them is painful. But uh, the the goal it has, and it's sometimes probably also questionable whether it can achieve that, but the goals it has, it wants to ma do markets more resilient, more transparent, more efficient. And um, and I think those kind of things are things exchanges stand for, you stands for, um, to, to keep on running even in 2008 or in a flash crash situation and things like that. Um, uh, to, to be resilient there, to, to perform, to be trans uh, provide transparency. And so our goal is, is sort of, if MIFID has this as a goal to and have that implemented through various new regulations, 
there's probably spots around us where we could add value from uh, by bringing those assets. Um, yep. So that would be my concluding yep. remarks. Okay. Um, well, well, that's that, that's a very good point, and I think um, just to revisit what we were seeing with the S curve, it's interesting that that dynamic um, is now developing because I think when we were all analyzing the rules initially, um, we could only see one direction of travel, um, you know, up to up to that order book side of things, and it's interesting that you know. Uh, the, those sitting, um, you know, at the top are now are now looking at the bottom, and we're actually seeing a bit of a counter trend, and that's um, that's actually going to be very positive and healthy because what that means is moving towards where the market is uh, and where the market likes to be, and kind of adapting, uh, you know, that that ultimate model and endpoint um, in, in a much more customizable way, and that was always the big advantage of the old bilateral OTC model was the cost of customizability there and the, the you know the ability um, to choose the ability to negotiate etc and the ability to develop those relationships um, so from my perspective um, to conclude and just to sharpen your minds I think it's it's fair to say we're about to enter uncharted waters hopefully you know we, we've helped to clarify a little bit some of the second order dynamics and the interesting things and the exciting things for the market that might be coming up um, in particular for that voice hybrid um, uh, rump of the market that has been you know widely viewed to be under attack by the intention of those rules um, uh, and, and and the I think one of the unintended consequences actually uh, might be to preserve uh, you, you know a lot a lot of the um, you know, key advantages of those markets uh, you know post January 2018 hopefully when we see the flows um, develop we're going to see uh, you know, rather than a complete overhaul um, or, or, and change of, of how people do things, uh, you know, an adaptation to preserve those key elements that people like within the, within those trading protocols that, you know, people have chosen to persist with. Um, and hopefully that'll start to make a lot more sense for people. Um, purely on the cost and compliance side of things, I think that being the driver um, for a lot of what we were talking about, the uh, pre-existing connectivity that people have, whether it's on platforms or exchanges or even, you know, with, um, uh, you know, third-party providers, uh, you know, people will start to be a, a cluster point for people to, to widen the utility to those things that we were talking about within best execution. I think it's, it's important to say that within fixed income, it's not really TCA as people in the equities world understand it, but trying to incorporate that kind of wider functionality, you're just going to see a lot, uh, an awful lot more of it, um, you know, as things go on. Um, and then as, as, as that, um, you know, automation increases as people centralize their trading desks, you're going to see exactly as Randolph was saying, uh, the uh, rolling out with uh, over over the wider spectrum of products, you know, across the asset classes, possibly developing to uh, a kind of relative value functionality for all of those things. That's and that includes data. And for fixed income, that's very important. So, you know, we mentioned fixed income ETFs and other alternatives earlier, um, or alluded to it, particularly within within the S curves. Those, you know, those have started to come on to, uh, on at the exchanges, but there's also a relative value element to that when you think about the economics of your trading, how that works, how you can make it more efficient from that cost and compliance side, um, and what the different treatments for the different um, instruments will mean, you know, for that sell side wallet that we just described earlier, but then also for those pressures that are on the end users um, and how they can get comfortable with uh, a, a kind of unified workflow within all of that. Um, and then just a final word on the best execution side um, and, and that capital um, element that, that feeds into it, you know, um, how the centralized venues um, can, can be, uh, once they are those hubs um, in the first instance uh, at the implementation point, which is what we saw with the U.S., how that functionality can then be rolled out in other areas um, and in more interesting ways. And, you know, I think that fixed income uh, option solution is, is very much one part of it within that selective RFQ side, but actually even within the open RFQ at the top of that S curve, you'll start to see, um, you know, evolutions developing very, very quickly. So probably, you know, by the end of next year, we'll start to see some winners and losers in terms of, um, you know, liquidity and sticking to that. 
Great. So on that, um, I'd like to thank everyone for sticking with us and for engaging with what has been a very interesting discussion. Um, and, um, you know, I would encourage you to get in touch if there are any follow-ups, uh, et cetera. I'm more than happy to, to engage with you on that. Thank you very much. Thanks, Randall, for your time. Thank you, Adi.